Please enjoy today's lecture, and we'll begin in just a moment. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Bob Bastris, uh, and I'm subbing this semester as associate dean, and I'm also subbing today for uh, Dean Joyce McConnell, who uh, was called to uh, duty by higher powers on the downtown campus for some other uh, uh, responsibilities. Uh, she regrets not being able to be here. The uh, Illenfeld lecture is one of the highlights of the school year, and uh, she regrets she, she'll not be able to, uh, to, to uh, listen to today's lecture. Uh, and, and to welcome you all here. Uh, it is my honor to introduce the Charles L. Illenfeld Lecture. This is the 19th uh, lectureship in this series, uh, which has been made possible by a generous bequest from Charles L. Illenfeld. Uh, Mr. Illenfeld lived the life of a respected professional. He practiced law for more than a half a century, distinguishing himself as a skillful, diligent, and eth ethical attorney. His career included a range of varied and important public service. Uh, he served from 1959 to 1967 on the city council of his beloved Wheeling, and as its mayor from 1963 to 1967. He chaired both the West, West Liberty State College Foundation and the Wheeling Creek Watershed Commission. He served two terms as the Ohio County uh, Prosecuting Attorney from 1940 to 1948, and as a uh, U.S. Magistrate Judge in the Northern District of West Virginia from 1971 to 1979. The word service and the name Charles L. Illenfeld were inextricably linked. It is therefore fitting that this lecture series bearing his name uh, focuses on issues of public service and ethics. The College of Law is at once proud and grateful that it can provide this series to honor a career marked by significant contributions to the legal profession and to memorialize a life distinguished by service to community and to the state. We are also uh, here at the College of Law extremely appreciative of the continued interest and support from the Illenfeld family and we are particularly pleased that Charles' son, uh, William Illenfeld, uh, is here with us today, and if uh, Mr. Illenfeld would stand, we could uh, acknowledge his presence and his <laughs> gratitude. Bill is a uh, 1965 uh, graduate of the College of Law, uh, and he has himself uh, established a, a distinguished career in the law, and I'm uh, proud to say, too, that his son, Bill, uh, Bill Second, uh, is a 1997 uh, graduate of the College of Law, and we thank the, uh, the entire family for their uh, continued support. Uh, and with that, I'll turn this mic over to uh, Professor Valerie Vidic, who will introduce today's speaker. Welcome. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce to you our Illenfeld speaker, uh, Professor Pat Chu. Uh, Professor Chu uh, teaches at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, uh, where she has been awarded uh, two very prestigious awards for, in honor of her teaching. First, the University Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award, uh, and secondly, uh, she's been named as one of the first law school's distinguished faculty scholars uh, from 2001 to 2004. Professor Chu received her Juris Doctor uh, from the University of Texas. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree in psychology and communications from Stanford University. She's also done graduate work as well in the School of Business and the School of Educational Psychology at the University of Texas. Um, at University of Pittsburgh, Professor Chu uh, has taught a wide variety of subjects. Um, most recently, sh her work has focused on decision-making in racial harassment cases, subtly sexist language in the profession and in law schools, and the role of culture and race in dis legal disputes. She's also been doing a wide range of really fascinating empirical research uh, in the area of employment uh, and employment laws uh, for multinational corporate managers. Her seminars most recently have focused on subtle sexism and subtle racism in the workplace. Uh, Professor Chu has authored uh, a number of books, treatises, and casebooks during her career, 
including uh, conflict, or con in, in, including the area of conflict resolution. Her texts have included consensual ADR processes, which she co-authored, the conflict and culture reader, uh, which she co which she edited, uh, and directors and officers liability. Um, she has written dozens of articles in leading law journals, uh, both in general interest journals and specialized journals as well. Her most recent work, uh, and she's going to be speaking about this to us today, is The Myth of the Colorblind Judge, an Empirical Analysis of Racial Harassment Cases, which was published in the Washington University Law Review and which was co-authored by Robert Kelly. She is a member of the American Law Institute um, and has served uh, on various committees with the American Association of Law Schools, including chair of the AALS section on women in legal education. She's worked with the American Bar Association as well. In 2006, uh, she was a co-founder of the Asian Pacific American Law Faculty Association. Prior to teaching, Professor Chu practiced corporate law and international law with Baker and McKenzie in Chicago and in San Francisco. Um, we are extremely pleased to uh, have Professor Chu as our Illenfeld lecturer today. Um, and with no further ado, I will introduce to you Professor Chu. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Um, first, I wanted to thank the West Virginia University Law School for inviting me, uh, Dean McConnell, uh, Dean Videk, and uh, the faculty that have been so hospitable uh, since I, my short visit here, and the many helpful staff and administrators. It's also a privilege to speak as part of a lecture series named after such a distinguished West Virginia lawyer who has been so dedic who was so dedicated to public service. So it's a pleasure for me to be part of his legacy. So thank you for that invitation. I begin with some simple observations, and that is that the composition of the federal judiciary is changing. In some very recent data we have more women in the federal judiciary than ever before. So that, for instance, now we have about 20% women in the federal bar compared to 80% males. On the other hand, we still acknowledge that the percentage of women in the judiciary is not yet representative of the women in society more generally, as indicated here where we have about 50% women and 50% men in the general population. The racial diversity of the judiciary is changing as well. Currently in the federal judiciary, we have about 19% judges of color, including African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. Once again, though, we have to acknowledge that the representation of minority judges does not yet reflect the representation of minorities in the general population, which approximates 30%. So on one hand, we're really pleased that the diversity of the judiciary is changing and is changing in the ways that I've indicated, but we also acknowledge that they're not yet representative of the general population. What does this increasing diversity mean? On one hand, uh, it certainly represents uh, symbolic significance, uh, but we wonder, in addition to being representational and symbolic, are there some substantive differences that are occurring? Uh, so, for instance, is the nature of legal decision-making and perhaps our legal outcomes changing because of the increasing diversity of judges? The answer to this, uh, the predicted answer to this, varies in part uh, dependent on the judicial model that you follow. So, for instance, one kind of judicial model would argue that judicial decision-making is largely a formalistic, a more mechanical kind of process, objective, if you will, and that uh, under this kind of formalistic model, it's unlikely that uh, the background of judges, including whether or not they are women or whether or not they're of color, would make a difference in 
outcomes, would make a substantive difference, if you will. Consistent with this first model of formalism is the notion that uh, professional training, legal training, judicial training, uh, to which judges are repeatedly exposed and socialized uh, to the profession's norms, really make a, a, a dominant difference and that this socialization prevails over any personal attributes or experiences. Now, a second model of judicial de decision making, on the other hand, sometimes called a realism model or a realistic model, involves a, 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 different, a different framing of how judicial decision making occurs. In this model, uh, the notion is that a judge's personal discretion and intuition, if you will, their background and their values, might make a difference in how they analyze the facts and the legal principles. This realism model is also complemented by this notion of personal attribution, which argues that judges' humanness is not left at the courtroom door and that judges' personal attributes and experiences consciously or perhaps unconsciously influence how they interpret the case facts and the legal principles. My colleagues and I decided to try to answer this question in a slightly uh, different way. We decided to do an empirical study of judicial opinions and ask the question, does the judge's race make a difference in, um, in how the cases uh, turn out? Our thinking was that to the extent we found that judges, uh, that uh, the decision making differed depending on the judge's race, then this would be evidence of a substantive difference dependent on an increasing diversity of the bench. So what we did, what we did is we studied racial harassment in the workplace cases on the federal level, both appellate court and district court cases, over a 20 year time period, six representative circuits. Uh, what we discovered, first of all, was that most of the judicial opinions in this area of the law are motions for summary judgment. So typically the issue before the court was whether or not to grant the employer's motion for summary judgment against the employee plaintiff. We also did a follow-up study in 2002-2008, where in this case, rather than just a random sampling, we did a universe of cases. Uh, so we did all the cases in the, in the district courts from these six circuits. You might ask, why did we pick racial harassment cases? And so I thought I would share with you uh, the answer, our answer to that question. First of all, we think it's a very important area of the law, as indicated by the many complaints that are brought in this area. So for instance, in the year 2007 alone, over 7,000 complaints were brought on racial harassment before the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. We also picked this area of the law because it presented really a very interesting racial triad in judicial decision making, in that the judges were typically white, which is not surprising given that um, the judiciary is dominantly white. The plaintiffs were uh, typically African American, and the alleged harassers were typically white. So you had this uh, racial triad in these disputes of uh, what was typically a white judge, an African American plaintiff, and an alleged harasser who was white. This area of the law also deals with very intriguing interpretational issues dealing with racial dynamics specifically. For, so for those of you who, who may have taken employment discrimination law, or, or for those of you who have not, uh, let me perhaps remind you that two key legal inquiries in this area are as follows. First, was the harassment severe or pervasive enough to actually alter the work environment so that it became racially hostile? And a second legal inquiry is, was the harassment because of race instead of some non-race related reason, such as uh, the uh, supervisor or coworker just simply didn't like the person or the person's work performance or something else? So we picked these cases for those three reasons, the importance of the area of law, the interesting racial triad it presented, and the interesting interpretational questions that dealt squarely with race dynamics. And what did we find? 
Well, before I tell you the answer to that, I thought you might indulge me, and I was going to ask you what you thought we found. And so, for instance, I'm going to ask you all three questions and ask you all to tell me what you thought by raising your hands. So let me first tell you what the questions are. The first one is, in these kind of cases, which are cases in racial harassment in employment, what is the employee plaintiff's success rate when the judge is white? And just to give you a forecast, the other two questions deal with when the judge is African American and when the judge is Hispanic. So on this question, what would you guess is the plaintiff's success rate when the judge is white? And the choices are about 10% success rate, 20% success rate, 30% success rate, or about 50% success rate. Okay, so I'm going to ask you all uh, to raise your hand depending on the answer that you think is correct. So all of you that think it's A, about 10%, if you would raise your hand. Okay. Uh, B, about 20%. Okay. C, about 30%. All right. And D, about 50%. Okay. All right. Before I tell you the answer, I'm going to move on to the next question. So try to make, if you will, a sort of mental note of the way you answer that question. All right, so the second question is, in these cases of racial harassment and employment, what is the plaintiff's success rate when the judge is African, oops, yes, when the judge is African American. All right, so the first question, when the judge is white, this is when the judge is African American. All right, so the same choices, 10%, 20%, 30%, and 50%. Okay, here we go again. How many of you think the answer is A, about 10%? Okay. B, about 20%. All right. C, about 30%. All right. And D, about 50%. Okay. All right. So, again, take mental note of what you said, and I'm making some observational uh, 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 Gestalt kind of observations as well. All right, question number three is uh, same type of cases, racial harassment and employment. What is the plaintiff's success rate when the judge is Hispanic? And I should say um, in deciding whether the judges are white, black, or Hispanic, uh, the uh, directory I used was self-identification. So the judges describe themselves as either white, African-American, or Hispanic. All right? So, okay. So choices, again, are the same, 10%, 20%, 30%, and 50%. But the judges in this question are Hispanic. Okay. So uh, how many of you think it's 10% A, uh, 20% B, 30% C, and 50% D. All right. Okay. Well, my sense of it was, uh, just by glancing out in the crowd, is that that uh, most of you all thought judges would reach a similar outcome independent of race. At least it seemed that way, although some of you thought certainly that uh, African-American judges were more likely to hold for the plaintiff, but not uh, in great uh, difference in terms of white judges. But uh, anyways, you, you, you can recall what, what uh, you voted, and now we'll look at what we found. What we found is that judges' race certainly does make a, a difference, and that when you look at all judges together, the plaintiff success rate is 22%. Or to put this differently, it's quite difficult for plaintiffs to be successful in these cases. They're only successful about, uh, well, one out of five times. Or, again, just to put it a little uh, differently, that uh, employers uh, tend to be successful about 80% of the time in these motion for summary judgment proceedings. Uh, but in addition, we see that there are differences in the case outcomes depending on the race of the judge. So, for instance, in question number one, uh, white judges had uh, a plaintiff success rate of about 20%. So for those of you who, who uh, uh, voted uh, that number were correct. And that African-American judges, in contrast, and in a statistically significant contrast, voted for the plaintiffs 46% of the time. So that they are about 50-50 and here I was just rounding the numbers. So the answer to that question would have been uh, the last choice, D. Uh, 
And then finally, when we look at Hispanic judges, what we find is that Hispanic judges have decision-making patterns similar to white judges, so that their success rate for the plaintiffs was also about 20 percent, a little less than white judges, but approximately 20 percent. So although certainly we cannot predict how any particular judge will vote on a particular case, what we did find is the judge's race is certainly statistically significant in case outcomes in these racial harassment cases. And when I say statistically significant, I mean that when we analyze the results and using different statistical methods, in this case we use chi-square, and cross tabulations is that what occurred did not seem to be occurring by chance. There seemed to be something happening that was significant that we could attribute to this variable, which is judge's race. Okay, what else did we find out in our study? We also found out, and we looked at a whole range of different variables about judge characteristics, we also found out that the political affiliation of the judge makes a difference as well. And we um, defined political affiliation in the following way. We defined it as the political party of the nominating president. So that, for instance, if the nominating president of this federal judge was Democratic, then we designated that judge as Democratic. And similarly, if the nominating president was Republican, we designated that uh, federal judge as Republican. And what we found, uh, as I said, is that the political affiliation made a difference. So as you can see in this chart, Democratic judges held for the plaintiff about 30 percent of the time, 29.3 percent of the time. That was the success rate for plaintiffs. In contrast, Republican judges who held for the plaintiff 17% of the time. So uh, more difficult for plaintiffs to be successful before Republican judges. Uh, or again, depending on the way you want to, to describe it, uh, it was more likely that uh, company defendants, employer defendants, would be successful before Republican judges. We also studied uh, specific characteristics of the cases themselves. And we found that judges of all races pay attention to specific characteristics of each case. And let me see if I can explain that in a little more detail. We found, for instance, that when the plaintiffs alleged racial slurs as part of their racial harassment, we took an allegation of racial slurs to signify uh, that um, the harassment was because of race as opposed to some other basis because a racial slur was actually used, that those plaintiffs were more likely to be successful. So if the baseline is 22% for all cases, as you can see in the far right-hand column, uh, then when there were racial slurs, uh, plaintiffs were successful 30% of the time, so more likely to be successful. And similarly, if the plaintiff alleged that both supervisors and co-workers harassed, and we view this as a kind of proxy for ganging up on the plaintiff, and therefore a kind of indicator that the harassment was severe or pervasive, as you recall, is one of the legal inquiries that judges must answer, then they were also much uh, more likely to be successful in their cases. 37% of the time they were successful, again, in contrast to the baseline of 22%. So not only were plaintiffs more successful when they made these claims, but they were more successful before every group of judges. They were more successful before white judges, black judges, and Hispanic judges. So that it appeared that um, relevant important factors are political affiliation and the characteristics of the case, but that these characteristics uh, are independently significant than judges race. In other words, they're not proxies for each other. Things are happening uh, independently of each other. So what are some of the issues and implications of this kind of research? And of course, you can imagine after spending five years on this kind of research, I think there's just lots of implications and, and, and issues. But let me share with you a few that I think uh, are uh, particularly relevant to our purpose today. Uh, first of all, let me take these two questions together. What are the practical consequences of this kind of research? And secondly, can we generalize the results of this kind of research to other kinds of cases and other kinds of contexts? Uh, first, on the question of practical consequences. When we do different statistical analyses again, logistical regressions, we were able to predict 
uh, how much of a difference it would make if the judge, for instance, was African-American versus uh, not African-American. And what we found is that it was about three times more likely for the plaintiffs to be successful if the judge was African-American versus not African-American. And uh, we can compare it, for instance, to white judges, where we found it was much more likely for plaintiffs to lose in comparison if their case was held before a white judge rather than an African-American judge. So in other words, there are real consequences of this kind of research for the litigants themselves. It makes a practical difference as well as a, um, an abstract difference or just merely an empirical difference uh, when we look at uh, this kind of research. Now, keep in mind, however, is that if we add more variables, if we look at more characteristics of judges, more characteristics of plaintiffs, more characteristics of the cases, then the consequence of any given variable, such as judges' race, will decrease. And so that's something to keep in mind as we think about these results. Second point here is can we generalize the results? This area of research is very much in its early stages, and in part this is because that the number of minority judges, for instance, is just reaching that uh, number that we can study it meaningfully, at least in an empirical fashion. And so this research is really in very early stages. But what I can share with you is some other research in this area that might be meaningful to the question of to what extent can we generalize the results that I just described in the empirical study that I and my colleagues engaged in. Uh, for instance, Adam Cox and Thomas Miles uh, did research on appellate court cases. Their research is published in the Columbia Law Review. And they found that judges' race also made a statistically significant difference in voting rights cases. And they also found that there were effects on the appellate panels themselves. So, for instance, not only was it more likely for an African-American judge to hold in favor of the plaintiff in a voting rights case, and the plaintiff classes tended to be African American. But also, if the appellate panel was mixed race, in other words, if there was at least one minority judge, typically an African American judge, that the panel itself was more likely to hold for the plaintiff. So there was some kind of information sharing, perhaps, an influence that was occurring when the panel was mixed race. So that's Adam Cox and Thomas Miles' research on appellate courts. Nancy Crow, a sociologist, also did research, research on appellate court cases, also found that the judge's race made a difference in racial discrimination and sexual discrimination cases with African-American judges more likely to hold for the plaintiffs in both kinds of cases, both racial discrimination and sexual discrimination. An interesting finding of Nancy Crow's was that the gender of the judge made a difference in sex discrimination cases but did not make a difference in race discrimination cases. And finally, one other example, Kenneth Manning, a political scientist, did uh, research on district court cases, federal district court cases, uh, across a number of subject areas. Uh, but what he focused on with Hispanic judges versus non-Hispanic judges, and what he found was that the Hispanic judges were more likely to hold for the defendants in civil rights cases. So, in other words, that was consistent with our finding that Hispanic judges are more likely to hold for defendants in, the, in civil rights cases. In our case, it was racial harassment cases. In his case, it was civil uh, rights cases more broadly. So what do I take from these uh, evolving uh, research studies? Uh, it appears, at least so far, given the judiciary as it stands today, that when you have disputes that deal with race uh, in some fairly direct fashion, so voting rights cases, racial harassment cases, race discrimination cases, that the judge's race makes a difference in outcomes. We do not yet know to what extent you can extrapolate this finding to non-race-linked cases. And so there is some emerging research on that, and some of them find, yes, it makes a difference. Other studies find, no, it does not make a difference. But at least in the race-based cases, the results seem to be pretty consistent, as I've suggested in these three studies. All right, what other questions, issues, and implications uh, can we discuss today? Second question 
or I guess it's the third question really, is, is it fair that parties have different outcomes dependent on the judge's race? So now we're getting to some, I think, very difficult, very potentially sensitive questions. Um, let me try to answer this question or begin to try to answer this question in this way. As I mentioned, many variables contribute to the outcome of cases. In our study, we focused on the variable of judges' race. But as we saw, other variables such as judges' political affiliation or the facts in the particular case also make a difference as well. And I think more broadly, we are empirically acknowledging what I think we've probably intuitively known already. As Supreme Court Justice Stevens uh, soon to be, I suppose, former Supreme Court Justice Stevens, recently said in an interview, and here I'm quoting, I've confessed to many people that I think my personal experiences have had an impact on what I've done, time and time again, not only for myself, but for other people on the court. During discussion of cases, you bring up experiences that are, you are familiar with. And as the reporter there, Adam Liptak, summarized Judge Stevens' remarks. Judge Stevens was unapologetic in saying that the justices' backgrounds necessarily shaped their approaches to the law. In addition, social scientists also confirm that race, for better or worse, continues to be a pervasive construct in our lives. Individuals of different races have different life experiences and are perceived differently by others. Survey after survey confirms that African Americans are more likely than white Americans to believe that racial discrimination persists, sometimes citing explicit racism, even in our world today, but much more likely to cite subtle racism. So in this sense, it's not surprising that judges of different races might interpret the same legal principles in certain areas of the law somewhat differently. Perhaps another way of saying this is they view the facts and they view the legal principles through their own cultural lens. What other questions are important for us to raise? Well, this question actually, or these two questions follow from the prior one. Since outcomes do differ by judge's race, is one set of outcomes more correct or wiser than another set? This is a little reminiscent, right, of Justice Sotomayor's comment. And who sets the standard? So if we have different outcomes, are we drawing some conclusions about which outcomes are more accurate, if you will? And I've been struck as I've done this research and had discussions with others, including judges and uh, law faculty and lawyers, et cetera, I've been struck by the range of assumptions that people seem to make when addressing these issues. And they may not articulate the issue quite the way I've done, but they certainly seem to be operating under certain assumptions. And here are some of the assumptions that some people seem to be operating under. Uh, one assumption, one, one um perspective is, first, that white judges must be correct. They are dispassionate and they're accurate in their assessment and the facts and the law. And because they're actually dispassionate, it makes them more accurate in their assessment of the facts and the law. So to the extent the outcomes are different, it's the white judges that are right. A second perspective, a second set of assumptions, is that no, African American judges are the ones who are correct. They really see what's going on in the dispute. They recognize both explicit and subtle racism that simply goes over the radar of white judges who haven't had the same life experiences that they have had. And in this sense, they are more accurate in their assessment of the facts and the law. A third set of assumptions, a third different kind of perspective, is, is indicated here, and that's that white judges are wrong. They don't want employment discrimination laws to be read in a way that makes the law disruptive to employers or the status quo. Or it could be they're just plain biased against the plaintiffs, who are usually black. And then finally, a fourth set of assumptions that I have heard in discussing this research and the results are that African-American judges are the wrong ones. 
They are too personally involved in these disputes, and they want the laws read in a way that is maximally protective of employees, even if and perhaps because it might disrupt the status quo. Or they're just plain biased against employers who are usually white. Well, certainly our empirical research does not answer this question directly. Plus, I really don't think the answer is as, forgive the simplicity of this, is as black and white as some believe. My own response to the question is the following. It's not that judges, it's not that white judges are black judges or Hispanic judges or any subset of judges set the standard. Rather, as always in our justice system, the law sets the standard. Our system of justice sets the standard. And that so long as judges of all colors adhere to the legal principles and statutory intent, which in this case is to eliminate racially hostile work environments, then I think that these multiple perspectives actually enrich the legal and factual analysis. We know from social science research that diversity among problem solvers enhances problem solving itself, leading to better solutions and certainly more creative solutions. Thus, diversity of judges hopefully moves us toward more nuanced and accurate assessments of racial harassment disputes, toward more nuanced and accurate assessments of what constitutes racially hostile work environments. So in this way, increasing judicial diversity helps us as a legal profession to better fulfill the promises of the law and the pursuit of justice. And that concludes my remarks, and thank you for sharing your time with me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this point, uh, anyone who would like to ask a question, if you could um, actually form a queue by the mic so we can, um, people who are listening through the webcast can hear you, um, that would be great. You know, this fall, for the first time, I taught in the first year at the University of Pittsburgh. I taught a torts class. And it was really so much fun and so exciting. But one of the things I learned about first-year law students, who I understand uh, there are some of you out there, uh, is that you, you ask such great questions. And you really uh, you see things that some of us more veteran types uh, tend to uh, perhaps overlook as we, uh, as we get uh, – into the, into the detail of our, of our legal analysis. So I welcome your questions, whatever they might be. I have a question in the meantime while sure. people are, are, are thinking. Yes. Um, in West Virginia, one of the things we're, we, the state has been doing is taking a look at its method of judicial selection. And um, based on some of the comments you said, do you have a view as to what method of judicial selection could best improve diversity on the bench? Uh, I don't study the judicial selection process, so certainly I can't speak with an expert uh, voice on that. But I, I think that to the extent one process tends to lead to more diverse candidates, making the process more open to a broader range of people, that I would think that that judicial selection process should be considered um, very seriously if possible. And when I say judicial diversity, actually in my own view, it's not just racial diversity and gender diversity, but diversity much more broadly, religious diversity, regional diversity, so so the economic class diversity. I come from Texas, for instance, and in Texas we often think we're a little bit sort of a culture of our own. And so uh, even regional diversity, for instance, I think certainly has, has meaningful context in judicial selection. And I suppose in a state system that would mean different regions of your state rather than perhaps, of course, different regions of the country. Yes, sir. Good morning. Do you have any uh, data that shows the success rate of Hispanic plaintiffs when they come before a Hispanic judge? Oh, it's interesting that you, you asked the question about the race of plaintiffs. Is that correct? Um, in this follow-up study that we're doing currently, we have added a more in-depth study of Hispanic judges specifically. So one reason we moved to the universe of cases as opposed to in this prior study we did 40% random sampling, which is still 
uh, a high percent, but in this, in this recent uh, study, uh, we did the universe of cases, so we get higher numbers of Hispanic judges. But we also studied, uh, so we get higher numbers by doing the universe, we also studied the plaintiff's uh, race as well. And so I don't, don't have the data right before me, but my memory off the top of my head, and I'd be glad to look at the specific data and share that with you if, if you want, you can email me, um, is that Hispanic plaintiffs tend to be more successful in these cases than, for instance, African American plaintiffs, or for that matter, Asian American plaintiffs, or for that matter, white plaintiffs as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I had a couple of questions. First one was Sir. similar to that. I was wanting to know about the uh, interactions between uh, plaintiffs and uh, the judge's race. And uh -huh. you started to get at that, but I mean, are those, are there both interaction effects and direct effects of race? There are certainly direct effects. So when we study only judges' race, we see effects. And when we study only judges, I'm sorry, plaintiffs' race, we see effects. And we're actually at the stage right now where we're looking at the interaction effects. So I, I can't, I feel like I'd, I'd probably be premature in, in describing the interactive effects. But that'll be very intriguing to see, for instance, if African-American judges are more likely to hold for African-American plaintiffs versus white plaintiffs or Hispanic plaintiffs, et cetera. Similarly with the white judges, et cetera. Or it perhaps uh, it could be uh, as at least a sort of an overview of the research has suggested, but again, I don't want it to, uh, to be too specific because I don't have the research in front of me and we're not done with the statistical analysis. It might be that African-American judges are more broadly speaking, more sympathetic to plaintiffs across the board. And that's possible as well. So not necessarily more sympathetic or more persuaded or more influenced by African-American plaintiffs, but simply more, um, uh, more inclined to, to appreciate the plaintiff's argument in these cases. And one indication of that was the research that I described uh, by uh, Nancy Crow, the sociologist, who found that African-American judges uh, tended to hold for the plaintiffs uh, in both sex discrimination and race discrimination cases, whereas women judges did not hold for um, in, sex, uh, in race discriminations more uh, than, uh, than male judges. So it might be that there some judges are, are have some other uh, intuitive or uh, a broader based kind of inclination, and it's not specific to the plaintiff's race. But why are you also interested in the plaintiff's race? I'm curious, because I've, I've chatted with different audiences, including judge groups, and you all are more astute about asking about plaintiff's race. So I'm wondering if there's some basis for that. Did you all, or, or not? Uh, I, well, I don't know, really. But um, maybe somebody else could better answer that. Question. Okay, all right, all but, right. Uh, just one other thing was, would you say that the relationship's getting uh, stronger between the judge's race and uh, how they rule on these cases, or is it getting weaker? I mean, did you run you, – how long did you pull the data over? It was how many years? We looked at the, at the first study, which is the one I'm describing now. It's a 20-year time period. It's essentially the time period during which – the courts recognized the harassment doctrine, really. So it's really sort of the history of racial harassment cases. And then more recently, we did this study, 2002, 2008. So it is a more contemporary view. And what we found uh, so far, again, just looking at the judge's race, is that, is that the percentages seem to be holding very steady. So in that sense, it does not appear, uh, at least at this point, that judges uh, race is having uh, a stronger or a weaker difference over time. But uh, in the earlier study, although we looked at a 20-year time period, uh, most of the cases occurred post-1991, which is a kind of interesting coincidence since there was the Civil Rights Act of 1991. But in any case, most of the cases occurred after 1991. So we're looking at uh, really sort of 1991 to 2002 versus 2002 to 2008. And at those two time periods, the judge's race as a variable had about the same amount of statistics, had, had about the same percentages in terms of plaintiff's success rate. But you, uh, you point out a very good um, uh, issue for us to keep in mind, which is as the judiciary uh, continues to change in its composition, which I think is inevitable actually, uh, how, might, how might the results how might the kind of results we see uh, differ? 
Uh, so, for instance, one difference we did see in the, between the two studies was that political affiliation seemed to be less important in more recent cases. And I think, uh, and this is just an hypothesis, this is just a guess on my part, um, uh, I think in part it might be because uh, presidents in more recent years have been appointing, uh, nominating judicial candidates which tend to have a more moderate position than perhaps the more polarized ideology of one political party or the other. So in that st sense, we're starting to see more judges who start to merge toward the middle. But I'm not, that's, uh, we, there's different ways we could try to test that out, and so this is just a guess on my part. But we did see that difference in the um, more recent cases versus the earlier cases. Thank you. Sure. And I actually will mention, since I mentioned other audiences and you all being more astute, at least on the question of plaintiff's race, is that when I asked that quest the questions that I asked you all uh, to a group of judges, mostly judges, it was at the American Bar Association mid-year meeting of the judicial division, so it was, it was a lot of judges in the audience, they uh, thought that uh, white judges were more likely to hold for the plaintiffs in a much greater percentage than I think your, your response has indicated. So, you know, I, um, there you have it. So. Optimi optimistic, I guess. Uh, I have a related interaction question. Uh, when, when, you put up, when you first put up the uh, judge uh, ruling for the, I guess for the defendants really, since it goes to a trial and a summary judgment, uh, I was thinking perhaps the African American judges are more willing to see both sides of a racial slur or hostile environment, et cetera, and send it to a jury. And so it was, I, I was interested to see your next slide, which showed exactly that, that for certain types of gang up activity or racial slur activity, uh, basically plaintiffs win more often and, and get to argue to a jury. So I'm wondering whether or not you look for interactive effects between uh, race of the judge and particular types of claims uh, to see whether or not that African American judges were more willing to let a plaintiff argue to the jury uh, for something that where uh, a white judge would simply say, oh, there's nothing wrong with that uh, and rule for the defendant. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by types of cases. These are all racial harassment cases. Most of them were motions for summary judgments, although there were some that were not. Well, I'm talking about types of activity. Oh, types of activity. So certain types of activity, uh, you know, because African-American judges more than half the time ruled for defendants. So right. there must be some types of activity where all judges of all races more than half the time say, you know what, the defendant's going to win. But here it's elevated for supervisors and coworkers and for racial slurs. Right. That's among all races. I'm wondering whether or not you see whether, you know, do African-American judges shoot up to 75% in racial ah, slurs, I see. for example. I see. I don't have those numbers before me, but what we did see is that the numbers did go up for every racial group so that uh, the each racial group did pay attention, or at least that's the way I'm interpreting it, did pay attention to the specific characteristic so that uh, if the plaintiffs alleged racial slurs, uh, that the plaintiff success rate went up for African-American judges and separately for white judges and also separately for Hispanic judges. But you haven't tested whether it was more for African-American judges, the increase? Uh, Percentage-wise, it was more. Are you, yeah, percentage-wise, it was, it was, it was more. Right. Oh, you, oh, you mean whether they went up in a higher degree? Right. Oh, you know, I, I'd have to go back and look at that data to see. I mean, one thing that's striking to me about this data is you're absolutely right that judges, uh, including African-American judges, are more likely to hold for the plaintiffs when these factors exist, but if you You'll note, even when there are racial slurs, the company employer is successful 70% of the time. So certainly unlike what some people think, you know, if you throw in a racial slur, the plaintiff will uh, be uh, okay on motion for summary judgment. That's actually not the case in these cases. So, um, so, but so I don't, I don't, if you, if you want to try to email me, I could look at that data more carefully to see if the degree of, um, of increase is higher, you're saying, for the African-American judges and for right. other groups. Because they're more willing to accept that mm -hmm. you know, something was the underlying. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. 
Thank you. This builds on some of your earlier comments, but I was curious about whether similar work had been done addressing this question with sex discrimination and the gender of judges. Yes, actually, and I had the occasion to give a talk on that topic at the University of Iowa in February. Uh, and although I don't do direct empirical research on that, although we did look at, actually, we did look in our own study on uh, judges' gender in racial harassment cases and found that it made no statistical uh, significant difference. But I did have an occasion to look at others' research, so I did a little bit of a overview of the research in that area and found that at this point in time, at least, and we've had a little more of a history to look at because uh, women judges have been in the judiciary a longer time period than judges of color for the most part, is that um, the judge's gender makes a difference in clearly in cases that deal with sex discrimination and, and sexual harassment, but that after that the results start to be more mixed. So, uh, so it's similar to what I was describing earlier. That, uh, uh, and one could again hypothesize. We could discuss this further whether or not there are certain topics which are simply more salient that trigger different experiences, um, uh, that different disputes. Uh, might prompt uh, individuals to uh, have to, to, to contribute more unique perspectives uh, because of the nature of the dispute itself. And for women judges, perhaps that's sexual discrimination. For minority judges, perhaps it's race discrimination and racial harassment. What we don't know are what other types of cases might also uh, touch on this sort of salience of, of dispute. That would that that might uh, result in different cases as well. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have any thoughts about predicting uh, the outcomes in other types of cases, uh, maybe where a labor case or economic disadvantage uh, entitlement case or something of that nature? Well, I think that's a really um, not only important question, but that's an important thing for us to do in the research, is to move beyond just focusing on one variable, no matter how important we think that variable might be. Um, we begin at this place because, in a way, it's sort of um, – it's like a research strategy. We're saying, where is it most likely, perhaps, that we would find these differences? So we look at judges' race in relation to racial harassment cases, gender of judges in relation to sex discrimination. And because if we didn't find any difference there, then that might suggest a different direction in our inquiry. But now that we seem to have found that difference in pretty meaningful um, statistical way, then now we can begin to explore the very questions you described. Now, for years, political scientists have studied political ideology and how that affects uh, judicial decision-making. In particular, of course, they've studied the Supreme Court, but they've also studied the federal courts as well, and in some cases, they've also studied, of course, the state courts. Uh, so we have that history of trying to understand how political ideology makes a difference. And not only do they study that from the standpoint of the way we did, which is really a kind of simplistic proxy by saying it's the Republican president who nominated the person, therefore the Republican, some people have gotten much more nuanced in that and look at a whole stream of, of, of uh, kinds of variables that might indicate one's political inclinations and see how that might make a difference in another type of case. So, uh, so there's a long history of studying political ideology in great detail. But to get back to your question, um, I'm hesitant to predict uh, because, as I say, uh, I want to be cautious about what we can draw from this kind of work. And I should say, even with racial diversity, there are lots of other ways to study the significance of racial diversity on the bench. We happen to use this approach. Empirically, there's also qualitative interviews where we could study uh, judges of different race and try to analyze interview them on what they consider. So interview them and try to understand in a more qualitative way exactly what they consider, how they consider it, et cetera. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. So I don't know the answer to your question. My hunch is that uh, what we should be looking 
for, or at least a likely hypothesis, is that there are some types of disputes that uh, will trigger different aspects of individuals' background. And it might be socioeconomic class, might trigger disputes that touch on poverty issues, for instance. Uh, you know, so, so uh, that kind of thing. Justice um, Stevens, I believe, said that he had experience in the military, and that certainly always affected the way he would view a dispute that had something to do with the military in some aspect. Sir. I'm, I have a question about the salience of the race labels themselves and the idea that uh, being the, the idea of there being a number of judges, because I noticed that the ratio was pretty close to representational in the United States of uh, black judges, mm -hmm. and that there may be more uh, salience about what it means to be um, black specifically than what it means to be Hispanic because of the kind of much broader <laughs> um, cultural landscape there in this country, right. which is not to say that blacks are homogenous. I know that that's not the case. But the difference between, say, people who are Mexican-American and have been here for six generations right. versus Cubans versus people who are coming from Central America more recently and how, what that makes up of that 7%. Because I would venture that at that level, you don't actually have enough judges to make a, an assessment of whether or not there's an actual kind of cultural implication in your findings. Uh, first, you, you, you raise a number, I think, of very good uh, points, and you raise a number of certainly important issues as well. Um, and it's interesting you raise the example of the Hispanic judges because when these results came out, I chatted with uh, uh, someone else who's, who, who has done work in race-related uh, topics, um, Michael Olivas, and, and he was saying that he um, at first was surprised by the result of the Hispanic judges, thinking that they would be more pro-plaintiff, but then he realized who becomes judges, right? And he was saying that he thinks particularly for the Hispanic judges, and by the way, I didn't choose again the name Hispanic because that's the name they use in the in the sources I was using, he thinks the Hispanic judges in particular come from a certain socioeconomic strata, education level, et cetera, and that uh, even places of origin, as you suggest, and that uh, when he thought about that more and thought about examples that he personally, individual examples, he said it made some sense to him that the result uh, was as it was. Uh, and uh, that perhaps, as you suggest, the African American, and again, of course, we, we you know, we lots of different diversity, but yet maybe there is a kind of commonality of experience that uh, is more pervasive than certainly for Hispanics. Uh, we are just beginning to study, for instance, Asian American judges, which perhaps are more like Hispanic judges. I don't know, but there are so few of them <laughs> right now that uh, we really although we included them and we can put them in the footnotes, we really can't say anything about them statistically. Uh, so, uh, but it appears at the moment at least that their judicial um, decision-making patterns, and again, this is very tentative because there are so few, et cetera, are more like Hispanic judges as an example. So uh, a number of good points that you raised. First, that uh, even to try to categorize uh, racial or ethnic uh, Identity among these different groups is very difficult given the diversity of the groups. But second, that uh, those who become judges are not necessarily reflective of any particular, uh, certainly not necessarily representative of the, of the subpopulation as a whole in American society. And that's... Uh, uh, for me, that's certainly something to recognize and as a caveat as we look at the, re as the results, uh, you know, to, per to think about further. Yes, sir. If I understand correctly, you, you said you only, your analysis is from a few circuits. Six. Six circuits. Um, have you compared and contrast the circuits among themselves and the volumes of cases uh, 
each deals with? Yes, and we picked those six circuits with great care. So we made sure that there was regional representation. We picked every circuit, which included cities and states with the highest diversity of general population. Uh, so we, we picked those six circuits with, with some care uh, to, to start with. And we did look at variation uh, among the circuits. And there was variation among the circuits, although statistically we found that the variable of circuits was not statistically significant. So that when you look at all the circuits themselves, for instance, the first circuit might have a very different outcome than the seventh circuit or the ninth circuit. These are all circuits that we included in the, in the analysis. But when you, when you took all the cases together, there did not appear to be um, uh, a meaningful difference in the circuits as a, as, a, as a variable. But I have to go back and look at that because I think that's a very good question too. And that's something certainly we should keep in mind. Anytime you take a sample, and we did that in both studies, although in the second study we did the universe of cases, it was still the universe of cases in these six circuits rather than in all circuits. And that was merely just a, you know, a, a, just feasibility is how many, already we had hundreds of cases. And uh, we just felt like, you know, we couldn't uh, feasibly, this, this, uh, this made sense and statistically, methodologically, we had obtained what was a, a quality representative sample. Thank you so much, Professor Chief. You're welcome. Um, thank you. And thank you all for attending. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Afterward, outside, if you have any other questions, um, you're welcome to ask.